Hi everyone, I'm Jane at Rock and Worms. Welcome. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is the strip down four factors that I think lead to a successful breeder bin. So the first thing I want to do is define what a successful breeder bin is. At least to me, it means lots and lots of cocoons with me not doing very much work to get there. So let's get into this bin here. This is one of my successful breeder bins. In fact, I would even say it's probably my most successful breeder bin to date. So I wanna share with you what it looks like, why I'm saying that, and what I think I did and you can do to make your breeder bins more successful, AKA more cocoons. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is talk about worm density. And that is how many worms are in your breeder bins. And the range, it's not a spectrum, the range is generally from 200 worms per square foot of surface area up to mm, a thousand square, <laughs> uh, a thousand worms per square foot of surface area. So that is quite the range. So um, I tend to be on the lower density part of that range, not all the way down to the, the uh, 100 or I'm sorry, 200 per square foot. I'm more in the 300, a little bit less per square foot. So as a specific, this bin here is close to two and a half square feet of surface area. The depth is important, but not quite as important because uh, worms are surface dwellers. And especially with a breeder bin, you're not going for, you know, the depth. So anything in the, you know, two and a half, three, four inches depth for your breeder bins is plenty deep enough. In fact, mine range around three inches and I've gotten lots of feedback over, you know, the years saying, you know, my breeder bins are deeper than necessary, okay? So depth isn't the big deal, surface area is. So with two and a half square feet of surface area, I have approximately 800 worms in here, okay? So let's see some of these worms. I'm already flipping things over. And uh, you can see <laughs> right away what I'm talking about as far as having success and having lots and lots of cocoons just coming up with the most casual flippage of the bedding. So obviously to get cocoons, you do need to have adult worms in there, all right? So think about your density, okay? You wanna go with, enough worms to you know meet and greet and do the hanky panky but perhaps not so many that uh it just gets overcrowded and you can see there's a lot of worms in here but they're not all you know jammed in you know just worm after worm and there's no bedding okay it seems to be i think a nice balanced mix and again you can see casual flipping Lots and lots of cocoons just coming up, all right? So worm density. Think about how you want to achieve your place on that spectrum, okay? The second thing that I think is important is bedding. Now, I'm a huge pre-compost fan as you know, if you've watched any of my other videos, that giving my worms pre-composted bedding, which I make for free, I'll put the link in the description on my how-to playlist. You know, it's seven videos, I think, using free or virtually, virtually free ingredients to make pre-compost is, uh, you know, I'll link that so you can do it too. But the reason I think my pre-compost bedding, and I do mix it with sifted cow manure, but it's not necessary. I do it because I can. I have cows, so I can, okay? But you don't have to do that. But just using something like pre-composted bedding or prepared bedding, 
if that's what you can do, just jump start the process of one, providing your worms with immediate food, okay? And we'll talk about food as number four, but providing your worms with immediate food to fuel their activities of which making cocoons is one of them. And I don't know for sure, I'll be honest, but I would assume that making cocoons takes energy, right? Just like making a, a baby for any of us takes energy. So providing your worms with immediate food in their bin as part of their bedding provides them with that access to immediate food, okay? And then of course, the bedding itself, let's flip again and see what we see for cocoons and beautiful worms. Look at this guy right here, by the way. It looks like uh, this worm is working on a cocoon. Let me see, flip them over, it's a little bit easier to see. See how bulgy that clitellum is? It's a sign of a red wiggler, a Ysenia species, and the you know, large bulginess, the extreme bulginess of it is a signal that it has mated and it will be getting ready to cast off that cocoon uh, within, you know, the foreseeable future. Okay, so um, the bedding, also when you have pre-composted bedding, look at all these cocoons over here. Oh my gosh, another big fat clitellum. Pre-composted bedding is full of bacteria and other biota in the bacteria, virus, yeast, you know, uh, spectrum that the worms can eat right away. It's also very close to their natural food. And the pre-composted bedding is naturally adjacent or adjacent to their natural environment, which would be a forest floor, okay? So this bedding, you know, mimics that forest floor composition of all that biota pretty well, okay? So again, once you put your adult breeder worms into an environment that mimics their natural environment, you know, they get comfortable right away and they start eating right away and they start making cocoons right away. So that's really great, okay? Now, the third part that I think is really very beneficial to breeder bin success is the moisture level. Now, you can see, I think, how very moist this bedding is. It's not mud, but it's, you know, adjacent to it. Now, what I also want to tell you, here's a bunch, look at all these cocoons just right here. I just picked up this random handful, cocoons and here by my glove. If I break it open a little bit, let's see if we get more cocoons in here. Some darker ones here. See, they're just all over the place, okay? Um, because the, the worms like moist, you want to give them moist, okay? But you don't want it drippy wet because you don't want to go anaerobic. It smells, it's, you know, it's not the greatest for the worms. So you need to manage the moisture. One of the benefits of pre-composted bedding is you can start it off with it being moist, okay? And because it is eaten so rapidly and so easily by your worms, they turn it into castings very quickly. And those castings are very, very good at retaining moisture, which is one of the reasons it's great for gardening, right? Because it retains moisture into your plant zone, root zone. Well, it retains moisture into your worm bin as well. So when some worm caretakers, worm wranglers, make their uh, breeder bin bedding, they started off with it at, you know, 90% unit uh, moisture level, 95% moisture level. I mean, it's really wet to begin with. With the pre-composted bedding, I don't feel that I need to start it off that wet because the worms are going to turn it into castings and it's going to hold on to the moisture that I put into the bin to begin with. All right. So I don't know if you follow all of that, but what I'm just saying is 
you know, you can kind of back off at the beginning moisture level because your bedding will turn into castings quickly and hold on to that moisture and keep it this wonderful, very damp, but not muddy, not sopping wet. In fact, you know what? Look at the bottom of the bin. I'm just noticing this now to point out to you. Look at the bottom of the bin. You can see it's not wet. There's no even droplets of water here. So it's very moist, but not wet. And that's what you're looking for, okay? So the last factor that I think needs to be, you know, zeroed in on, and we've touched on it a little bit already, is what are you feeding your worms? Because the easier they can, let me uh, show you some more worms, the easier they can eat and kind of get that function out of the way, the more time and energy they can put on reproducing. All right, so I do also add in, you know, worm chow, my grains and greens, um, worm chow, and also my veggie powder. Now, the grains and greens or worm chow, okay, gives the, the worms a lot of protein and a lot of carbs. And that keeps them in the bigger, chunkier range, fat and sassy and healthy, which, you know, is good for them anyways. Look at here, these guys, look at these. But also, because cocoons are formed around the girth of the worm, it, you know, fatter worms give you bigger cocoons. And, you know, that's kind of nice for, you know, seeing them easier or picking them out easier and just, you know, glorifying <laughs> in the number of cocoons you have. So protein and carbs from worm chow, very helpful. The veggie powder that I use, and again, it doesn't have to be in the petty veggie powder form, but I do use it exclusively, not exclusively. Yeah, I guess exclusively in my worm bin. If I give them vegetables, it is in the veggie powder form. How about that? Um, because the veggie powder form is, again, so fine and particleized, if that's a word. The worms can just, you know, suck it up like a vacuum cleaner. So again, it's easy food. The veggie component gives them, um, you know, food variety and, you know, different minerals and vitamins that, you know, they won't necessarily get through a worm chow mixture and not necessarily through just a biota um, mixture. So again, that food variety, I think, is really important. So those are the four things that I would suggest if you're interested in breeder bins and getting lots of cocoons from your worms that you think about, okay? Worm density, uh, bedding, moisture level, and lastly, the food. But here is a little surprise for you. Here it is. There's a lot of cocoons in here, right? Guess what? This isn't even all of them by any stretch of the imagination. Here is cocoons that I've already picked out of this bin because these cocoons are going to new homes. This is 1,111 ha, 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 cocoons that I picked out last night from this bin. And here is another 275 cocoons that I picked out of this bin last night. So rough ad, this is 1,380, I don't know, whatever it is, seven, whatever, uh, cocoons. So let's round up, give me a break. 1,400 cocoons out of this bin last night. And then I'm gonna set these down for a minute because they are being shipped off tomorrow, like I said, to their new home. Um, and look at all these cocoons. Come on, there's gotta be at least a couple hundred, several hundred cocoons in here. So I would say it wouldn't be out of the ballpark to say that in total this bin for the last 21 days with approximately 800 worms is throwing off in the ballpark of say 2,400 cocoons. Yes, I'm kind of making that number up, but it makes sense, okay? And 2,400 cocoons, rough number, 800 worms, would mean that I'm getting three cocoons per worm for the cycle. 
And that, of course, is on average one cocoon per worm per week for this cycle. And let me tell you, folks, that's pretty darn good. We all hear, hear about the, you know, mystical goal of, you know, three cocoons per worm per week. But I have yet to hear, hear anybody in real life, so to speak. Um, one last look at the worms, the cocoons, the bedding, the moisture, everything in here. Um, I have yet to hear of anybody, you know, achieving that. So give me some comments down below. What are you doing to maximize the cocoons in your breeder bins? What are you finding works for you? Because if you've got some tip or trick, I'm all ears. I want to hear it. And I want to share it with everybody, okay? Because the castings crew are the best at sharing success stories and things that didn't work out so well. So let's keep talking to each other. In the meantime, I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching, S subscribing, liking, all that good stuff. And I remain, as always, yours in the dirt.